Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 610. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. Today is July 7th, 2020. All right, it, it's fair that I tell you where I am. I mean, I'm kind of taking a long extended summer vacation uh, through the, the Midwest here, and I'm in Kansas, Topeka, Kansas. I think that's the state capital. Uh, this is the home of Jill's brother, who's uh, helping us mooch dock. I'm gonna give you some, you're gonna learn some new terms and terminology as I'm driving this country in an RV. Mooch docking is when you park in somebody's driveway and you plug into their electricity uh, for your RV and you use their washer and dryer and their bathroom. And so you're mooching off them. It's called mooch docking. Boondocking is when you are out in the middle of nowhere and you're plugged into nothing but you're camping overnight, relying just solely on your RV. Whether you have solar, generator, or batteries, you're existing by yourself. Uh, on our way out here, our first stop, we stayed overnight at a Cracker Barrel. They have RV spots where you can park. That was boondocking because we had the generator on, the AC, we felt really nice. Here is our first. <laughs> We're in a middle class neighborhood with a huge 40 foot uh, RV parked in the driveway. It's, it's an eyesore, I assure you. So we're moving on. Don't worry. George, uh, how are you doing? Fly, Kevin. I just think your brother-in-law is going to have the homeowners association <laughs> visiting in the next day or so, unless you're not out of there soon. I, oh. Anybody who's familiar with the National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation, I'm cousin Eddie. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh my! So it, it's a lot of fun. We're out here, and we're just we're traveling uh, as long as we want to travel. Our Jobs allow us to do that, where we uh, can work from the road. As long as we have internet or Wi-Fi, we're good. And that's what we're doing. We're taking advantage of it. this strange situation that COVID and uh, the riots has caused and, and the depression and recession here in America. We're going to visit America, and uh, I'm going to have a separate little video series where we interview and talk to people and uh, show you what's going on in, in America, the middle land, so to speak. Uh, George, how's the family? Very good, very good. Mm -hmm. We are in the ch at the church here. We're in the process of our survey of all the members. Uh, every member canvas on their views on the reopening. Mm -hmm. And we are giving it a whole week, but we've had a third of the responses back uh, within just a day or so. And it's quite telling. The, it's running about 70-30, stay closed because of fears of the spreading virus. And it's heartening because people are saying, we want to come back, we identify with the church, we continue to support the church, but we're not going to be physically present until the church is fully disinfected and we see the protocols that you have in place and we see that there's some sort of leadership on combating the disease, both at the local, state, church, and national level. Sure. And we're a little scared right now because we don't see any of that. Well, Florida, you're having another breakout. What you guys, especially in your county, you have avoided COVID until two weeks ago. Yes. Uh, if, if you look at it in terms of the number of infections, we had all, almost over 100. And we had about 24 deaths uh, in that time. So it was pretty bad. And now we're up to 400, but we've had no deaths. Mm -hmm. So what we're seeing is a rapid rise in the number of infections reported but uh, only uh, yes as of Thursday of last week there were only eight people in the hospital with COVID and nobody has died yet so it's we're seeing sort of a, a huge spike in number of reported illnesses but a dramatic decrease in the severity of these illnesses and hospitalizations. Two parishioners have adult sons who uh, we're praying for because they both come down with COVID and neither of them show symptoms and are both doing well, but they tested as part of their work environment and uh, they found to have the COVID virus. Yeah, we're heading out towards Arizona. People are asking where we're going to Arizona, going to Flagstaff, why? You'll learn when we get there. But Arizona has a, had a breakout and there's, you know, they're talking about uh, Phoenix has it bad, 
uh, Tucson has it bad, Flagstaff has it bad, so much so that states like New York and Connecticut say if you come back you have to quarantine yourself for two weeks. And uh, then Connecticut just announced this morning phase three has been suspended. We're not going to enter into phase three. I forget what that is, but phase three was almost back to normal where you could go to restaurants and have full capacity. And uh, that's suspended indefinitely until they can figure this out. And I don't remember if people remember. So, early, so, early. That, I'm, so that there are no warnings or they've just frozen the current warnings in place? Yeah, we're going to stay in phase two. So phase two is restaurants at 25% capacity, churches 25% capacity, um, wear a mask whenever you, wherever you are, except for exercising outside. And in a restaurant, you put the you take the mask off when the food is served, put it back on when you're done. We, you know, what we do is we get takeout, so we don't have to experience that wonderful mask eating. So, oh, yeah. at our at our local, uh, we have an outdoor restaurant uh, mm -hmm. uh, here, and I there was a fellow who had a mask on, and he had put a little hole in his mask, and he would put his straw in, but he would put a cigarette in uh, the little hole. I thought that was uh, that rather amusing. Oh my gosh, I love that. I love the ingenuity. Uh, you know, America's cool because of, you know, the ingenuity I've seen over this last uh, 14, uh, or not 20 weeks. But the problem is people, George, are getting tired of COVID. They're tired of being locked down. They're tired of uh, so much so that when they open the doors, the pubs in England, the bars in New York, and the bars around the world, they just they take off their mask and they party like it's nineteen you know ninety what was nineteen eighty nine again. So, um, well for you and me, like it's nineteen eighty nine again. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that's the last time I partied. And, oh. You know, it's it's hard to. There's no in between. People don't know how to have an in-between in protection yes you're allowed to go outside and go to the bars but be careful wear a mask it's okay young people they just go out and have fun and uh hug each other you know yeah so well it's really we've really seen in america the death of the experts mm -hmm. and that we've had these fellows on tv uh medical experts uh telling us all these dire predictions and dire warnings and that you know you can't you can't assemble in church you can't do this and that and then we've had the same experts say oh well you can go and be in a protest with a thousand other people for black lives matter sure. that's not a health risk but you can't stop at the 7-eleven and get get a pack of cigarettes on the way without a mask and you can't go to church afterwards to pray but you can protest so that people are not foolish and that we've seen science as is practice on a political level be so politicized that frankly if it used to be remember the Al Gore phrase the science tells us yes well it didn't help to have Al Gore say that for political reasons sure but now when you have science experts on the various news channels I feel like I'm in court. You've got the, your experts. You've got your experts. I don't believe either one. George, so, it is COVID safe to burn down a church in a riot. It is not COVID safe to sing inside the church. So it's it, so they so that the the old ways of deference to sort of uh, scientific or authority have just vanquished. Now, this, I think, will have its trigger effect because we get these people who talk about climate change. And the same skepticism that I see now being applied to epidemiology, I think, is going to be applied to the climate change uh, doomsayers. Um, I think, for good or ill, people feel that they have been misled. Yeah, absolutely. And Or there's no real experts. To be a climate scientist or... When you and I were growing up, authority was given to individuals. Scientists had authority because they were dealing with facts and they were dealing with math and they were dealing with conclusions and they were dealing with uh, results from scientific experiments. A scientist can speak with authority. And we as kids in, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s learned that. 
a scientist knows what he's talking about, he wouldn't lie to you or mislead you for any reason whatsoever. Except I learned in college that everything has a bias. Mm -hmm. Scientists have a bias. Science itself has a bias. Religion has a bias. Everything has a bias. And when you get right down to it, conservatives have their own bias and liberals have their own bias. And liberals protect themselves and conservatives protect themselves. I'm going to well, transition we, here to a story about a, a lady friend of yours from South Africa. Do you want to tell us about Yes, yeah, so I've been Facebook friends for a number of years with a South African woman priest named June Dolly Major. She was in the news recently, and I hope to write an article about her for Anglican Inc. She did a seven-day hunger strike in front of Bishop's Court, the residence of the Archbishop of Cape Town. Mm -hmm and the TV cameras and the newspapers were there to record this. Why would she be doing a hunger strike? Well, I should say she's a pro-Palestinian activist. She's on the, the theological left. She basically wouldn't see, appear to be on the uh, surface to be someone whom I would have much in common with other than being a fellow priest. She is as liberal as the archbishop she's protesting. Yes. Here's the story. A number of years ago, when she was a young priest, she was raped by a senior priest, a man. She brought this complaint to the bishop. The bishop ignored it. She brought it to the police. The police lost the complaint. She's of mixed race. And their Did, race. She also got fired. And she also got fired yeah. for uh, bringing this complaint to the, uh, to the attention of the church. And she attempted to get another job, and the bishop basically refused to give her a good reference. And, and now she's reached the point where the Archbishop of Cape Town, Tabo Makoba, who is always on the TV and radio in South Africa talking about gender violence and how we have to believe victims and how we have to have compassion for the persecuted, she had to skate, skate, wage a hunger strike to get his attention. He, he knew about her issue already, but after a week he said, yes, we'll investigate and we won't sweep it under the carpet anymore. Now, what does this tell us? Well, the Peter Ball story was about Anglo-Catholics. The John Smythe story was about uh, evangelicals. Evan conservative evangelicals. Mm -hmm. The June major story is about liberals, and they all have in common that the establishment protects its own. The victim, whether it's a conservative perpetrator or a liberal perpetrator, is almost never believed by the establishment. And even though these people, even though the, the establishment will get on the TV and make these speeches, and talk about gender violence and rights of women and all this and that, when it comes to cleaning up their own house, if it inconveniences the people in power, they lose the file. Uh, it, you know, or it disappears in a flood in the basement. Or it disappears yeah. into a flood. <laughs> so that I'm not trying to make this a political issue because it's not a political issue. Yeah. And abuse is never a political issue. Abuse can be political. But what I'm saying here is that the abuse that we're seeing reported in the West is mirrored all across the Anglican world. Here, this is in in South Africa. Uh, it's not a white black issue at all. It's a power issue. It's a it's a men That's using sex to dominate and degrade women, and they happen to be clergy. And George is always a power issue. You know, when you're protecting your own, you're protecting the kingdom that you built, or the kingdom that you're part of. You know, it was a liberal kingdom or a conservative king or a bishop's kingdom, whatever it is, you're protecting that power. It's always about power. And I, I hate to see this. I hope she finds justice in that system. I don't know. That, that's, that's a hard one. And see, here's, here's the terrible, damaging thing is that she can never really come to a sense of peace in this, of the institution that is the vehicle for expression of her face, her faith, faith. is the one oppressing her. You she can ask God for the power to forgive those who are hurting you, and God can grant you that power, 
but if you're doing it along the guidelines and methods of the Anglican Church of Southern Africa, and the Anglican Church of Southern Africa continues the perpe perpe to perpetuate abuse, to continues to permit crooked bishops. Now, we've had stories about uh, crooked bishops in South Africa. Remember the bishop who was going to have an audit by the National Church, and the day before the auditors arrived, the cathedral burned down. Oh, wow. my goodness. Isn't that so weird? How did that happen? <laughs> Oh. Can well, candles. You know, uh, one of the biggest dangers in cathedrals, George, is the candles. And, you know, you just shouldn't store open barrels of gasoline yeah. around the altar <laughs> when the candles are lit. How did somebody not know that? Just, yeah, weird. So, you know, we may joke, it is a joke in some sense, our recurring inside joke. We can always talk about Indian corruption. We don't mean to pick on the Indians. No. There's, I, in my time, I have reported about Kenyan corruption, South African corruption, Uganda corruption, American corruption. Sure. It's a sin is a universal phenomena, mm -hmm. as is hypocrisy, and what we're seeing here is the hypocrisy of church leaders speaking out of both sides of their mouth, of playing up the rights of victims, and then victimizing the victims if they happen to be in their own backyard. Mm. So right. pray for this priest June absolutely, Dolly Major. Absolutely. So okay. Uh, any other stories we want to cover? I think we did the. Uh, Dolly. No, we have we have the startling discovery by the Archbishop of York. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, well let's cover that quick. Uh, if people in the RV about uh, a block away or outside the driveway here is my power cord, so we're running down a battery. George, we got like not a whole lot of time here to talk. Quickly do the Archbishop story of York, the brand new Archbishop of York before this computer dies. Well, to the eternal delight and joy of the Sunday Times, they interviewed Stephen Cottrell, or Cottrell, and he just made sure everybody knows that he is a wingnut, a dingbat, a total goofball. A sellout. Uh, well, God bless him, but oh, it's not as good as Kevin Catherine Jefford Shorey back. No, no, but... He basically, during the interview, wanted to be sure the interviewer knew that Jesus is black. And he, com he complained about, oh, it's terrible. There are not enough blacks in positions of leadership in the Church of England. He is replacing a black a man. <laughs> and he's complaining about there are not enough uh, minorities among the leaders of the Church of England. And he's taken the job. And I, there's now, that, I'm going to help him out here. Archbishop of York, there's not enough Muslims in the Christian church in, in, in England. I mean, that's... Well, there, there, there are enough atheists. I think they're overrepresented <laughs> in the hierarchy of the Church of England. But so Cottrell gives, uh, gives this totally asinine, and I, I do mean this in the kindest possible words, not, he wasn't malicious, he wasn't mean, he just doesn't have the gift of cogitation. Well, can um, George, can I call it anti-Semitic? Yes. Well, this is what conservative commentators have raised. Hmm. Uh, well, what he said was that he talked about the lack of uh, black uh, uh, leadership in the Church of England, and then went on to say, and by the way, Jesus Christ was black. And this caused a bit of a ruckus, and it did him no favors. Conservative Ian Paul, who was uh, has sure. the Faceva, uh, he a has a great website. Yes, yeah. Um, and people have asked that he come on the show. Uh, we've asked him, but he hasn't. He's had he hasn't time. He's a busy guy. He's a busy guy. He wrote back, either the Archbishop of York is just pandering to the latest political fad, or he's deeply anti-Semitic. Because <laughs> Jesus was a Jew. He was. And the Jews have never been considered black by anybody. Or, Jews, a, or Asian, or, you know, or... The, so. Jesus was a, of, uh, had the coloring, if we look at genetics and biology and history and all this and that, of people that live in First Egypt century. and in Greece yeah. and in Spain and in Italy. African horn, yeah. Darker skin, darker hair. Uh, mm -hmm. That's just, Jesus was a historical person. Yes. But Cottrell is denying that Jesus was a historical person. He's, he's saying that he's a black man, and I've seen African commentators who are saying, how stupid do you think we are 
you know, we know Jesus was a Jew, and there are Ethiopian Jews who are black, but then there are Polish Jews who have blonde hair and blue eyes. Jesus, you know, and then we have one of our Asian commentators and contributors writing on our website, well, of course, Jesus was Asian. And it's uh, just, it's just so, and, and then you've got the, uh, the perpetually aggrieved black activists and uh, non-white activists in England, they weren't happy about this statement. In fact, they decided to run with this and use this as a club in which to beat up the Archbishop of York for hypocrisy of taking a black man's job and complaining there are not enough black men. You can solve this problem, Archbishop, by resigning. Yeah, absolutely. Now, the, I, in a theology con concept here, real quick, Paul said, be all things to all men. If you want to, just in that moment, think of Jesus as Asian or black or red or white, I don't care. Just to be all things to all men. You picture him, if that helps you and comforts you, that's great. His heritage, his genealogy, his prophet, fulfillment of prophecy was to be Jewish, and he was Jewish. He's a but, child of Abraham, a descendant of David. Yeah. Oh, uh, and, but it's just. Well, on one hand, Kevin, for you and me, it's good news because I'm sure we'll be served up with wonderful I little like tidbits of inanity like that we guy. can we can wax indulgent over the coming years. People are but tired of Justin news. We need to get a brand new guy. <laughs> well, I think maybe maybe this was a very very clever plan by Justin Welby to move <laughs> the heat off of him and allow somebody to be even more silly and more politically inept in dealing with the press. I don't. I don't know. All right, I need to cut it here. We're we're down to like six minutes left on the laptop before the battery dies. I will <clears throat> be sure to plug it in next time. Sorry about that, guys. I'm traveling. I'm just getting used used to this new life of mooch docking, boondocking, and living in the RV. Where's the next stop going to be? Uh, we're gonna drive six hours. My rule is, and Jill's rule is, just drive, 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 drive till we get there. My rule is six hours a day. We're going all the way across the country. I'll drive for six hours, we'll camp. And so whatever six hours southwest of uh, Topeka, we'll be there uh, tomorrow. So. Is that Gallup, New Mexico? So that's good. I don't know, I didn't look at the map yet. This is a vacation. I'm not that advanced at planning. Hi, I'm Kevin at, Call. What's that? Are you gonna visit the Oklahoma Panhandle? And uh... Well, here's the fun thing. Uh, when you're driving down an interstate in the Midwest, they have these big billboards you drive by. Next exit, George's Fudge Emporium. Passion Adult Entertainment Emporium. Drugstore Emporium. Fireworks Emporium. As you're just driving down the road, all these billboards that you go by. And uh, I saw, and we didn't stop it. I kind of regret it. We drove by the largest mailbox. It had three or four different billboards. Stop here at this tourist, you know, gotcha place. And you can see all these gigantic mailboxes. I'm like, well, are you on Route 60, taking Route 66? We're on 70. I don't, 66 doesn't exist in full anymore. I think they, they broke that up in the late 80s. But uh, we're going to go southwest. Then we're going to go to Flagstaff. Then we're going to Utah. Then we're going to head back um, towards the Minnesota, Wisconsin area. And this, every couple days, pick up and go somewhere else. All I know is I go where Mrs. Anglican TV tells me to go. She doesn't want to drive. She wants to look out the big window and take pictures. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 610 of Anglican Unscripted.